Okay, welcome to Changing Streams uh, Conversations. Um, today we're going to be talking about Plastic Free July and what we can do as an individual. But I'm absolutely sure that the conversation is going to move into lots of different directions, knowing the panellists. Uh, so we're in for a, a bit of an interesting uh, hour. So, uh, yeah, so I'm Brendan Kenny, uh, co-founder with Neil uh, of Changing Streams. I'll be hosting the, the webinar. So I'd like to introduce uh, each of the individual panellists, or in fact, let them introduce themselves, because they're obviously far better at talking about themselves than I am. Uh, so I'll start with you, Neil. Right, yeah. Hi, I'm Neil Maxwell, um, co-founder of Changing Streams, uh, on the back of a, an expedition that did to the Arctic in 2018, um, which opened my eyes to the impact that humans are having on this delicate planet we call home. I've had 32 years experience in the construction industry, primarily in fit out, which is why we are now looking at plastic or reducing plastic that's used in the construction sector. Brilliant, thank you, Neil. Antoinette. Uh, hi there, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, for having uh, me on the panel. Um, my name's Antoinette Vermilia. I'm the co-founder of the Gallifrey Foundation, and that's really a, a venture philanthropy organization uh, working on, on the oceans and marine resources. So, you know, why am I here? Well, my journey of learning started um, looking at fish in the ocean and then fishes eating plastic and then working my way slowly upstream to the point that I, I got to uh, a very sinister revelation, understanding that actually plastics are harmful to humans at the first point of contact. I mean, if we think about it, you know, plastics are made from oil and gas and petrochemicals and plasticizers are added to them to give them their various qualities, as you will know, Neil, you know, hard, soft, flexible or whatever. And these are leaching into our food and drink and affecting our health. So as they're prevalent every, in our everyday lives, that's what I'm here to talk about and the steps you can take to mitigate that. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Claire. Hi, everybody. Nice to virtually see you all. Um, my name is Claire Potter. I am based on the South Coast in Brighton, and I run a multidisciplinary design, interior architecture and research studio. Um, we have been working in the circular economy since 2008. And um, with everything we do, we do from designing interior spaces all the way through to product research and things like behavior change campaigns, which is um, what we've been doing for the last few years under the badge of Plastic Free Pledge. And also we're doing educational programs through our, our latest resource, which is called One Circular World. Um, as well as that, I'm a regional rep for Surfers Against Sewage, where I talk about the plastic and I talk about the pollution elements. Um, I don't surf, but I'm a snowboarder and I don't know a lot about poo, but I can talk about the plastic. So that's where I fit in there. Uh, and I'm also the working group uh, coordinator for the solutions, uh, replicating solutions working group for the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which is uh, specifically centered around ghost gear. Uh, so that's fishing gear that's been abandoned, lost um, uh, at sea. And this is global and everything from small studios like mine all the way through to large governments. And then on top of that, I also teach at the University of Sussex. So I'm head of product design up there, which is brilliant to be able to sort of invigorate the next generation of product designers who are responsible for actually producing the stuff that we have in our everyday lives of all scales from tiny things <coughs> all the way through to massive stuff. So, yeah, everything based around the circular economy is my bag. Fantastic, Claire. Amanda. Hi everyone, it's brilliant to be here today. So I'm Amanda Keatsley, co-founder of Less Plastic CIC, um, which I set up in 2015, um, really shortly after moving to South Devon um, near the coast and kind of seeing for myself the scale of plastic pollution that um, washes up on our coasts in the winter. And this was kind of pre-Blue Planet 2 and um, lots of people being aware about this. And my background is marketing and communications. So I kind of saw this issue and realized I needed to um, share it really with people and was um, sharing pictures and images of the you know the horrible plastic and seals being caught up in fishing that and and the kind of things that I was seeing on the coast but then also trying to um, find practical ways um, first of all as a family um, and you know as sort of individuals and communities of how to reduce plastic rather than sort of just try and stop it going into the sea like let's reduce it at source um, and then so so really I kind of I created these things which people may have seen and I'll talk about these a bit more probably later but they're like infographics um, that went 
very viral actually we were quite lucky um in the early days that people really wanted to share these and um they worked really well both sort of online and also people were printing them out and um, for their schools and workplace and um and translating them into multiple languages as well and then um so i sort of look at the angle for how individuals can reduce plastic use um but also at organizations and in 2019 i wrote a book plastic game changer um, which was really to sort of say that, yes, you can make the differences in your own life, but you can make an even bigger impact if um, you, at any level in an organisation, start talking about how can we reduce plastic and take responsibility for whatever our, our products or packaging or services are, and um, to reduce plastic and have a ripple effect sort of through our um, colleagues and supply chains and also customers. So we can talk a bit more about that later. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Well, I'll start off um, with the circular economy <coughs> and I'd, I'd like the panel to please explain what they mean by the circular economy. And we'll start with our expert here, Claire. Oh, so you always about the, the terminology expert always gives me the shivers. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the circular economy is incredibly complicated, but it's incredibly simple if you think in certain ways. So the way I generally explain it to people, if you haven't heard the term before, is to think at the moment how we work. So we work in a linear nature. So we dig stuff up or we grow stuff. We take something, we make something, we use something, and that could be a shirt through to a pen, through to a car. And then at end of life, whether that's very quick or over a long period of time, it ends up uh, landfill incineration, sometimes partially recycled. But it has a linear system. So a cradle to grave is another way that we can talk about it. But if we think about the way nature works, Nature works in loops and circles. So the waste from one process becomes the food or benefits some other species. And we're the only species on the planet that actually works in a linear way. Everything else works interconnected and helps each other and creates what we know as the biodiversity and our biosphere itself. So we're the outliers. So what a circular economy looks to do is to try and pick up on all of those cues that nature has been doing since you know year dot and figure out how we can work more in circular ways looping ways and that could be everything from reuse repair yes recycling is in there as well but there are a multitude of different actions we can do to stop that cradle to grave and keep things going round and round and round as much as possible or in circular terms we call it in the loop so that's how i basically describe the circular economy Antoinette, I don't think I could describe it any better than that, yeah. Claire. That is amazing. No, I'm 100% behind every word that you've said. The only thing I would say is that humans seem to be, as you have said, um, particularly masterful at only linear. And there's an end of the line to that. And it's a big trash bag that is just filling up and up and up with more and more. And until we actually stop what we're doing and really take stock and reconsider our, our systemic processes, um, we're still heading in that direction. So I, I love what you say. And that's what we should all be aspiring for, from a business, politician, individual, institutions, and, um, and more. Brilliant. Neil, anything to add, or Amanda? I, well, to be honest with you, I, I fully, what Antoinette just said, completely, you know, resonate with that. And Claire, that was perfect. That was beautiful, what you've just said. You've, you've framed it absolutely beautifully. Um, I'd like to capture that in a book, actually. It's, it's perfect. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Fine enough. It is yes. captured in my book, which is coming out in September. <laughs> excellent, excellent. No, I think I think it's beautiful. Uh, the only thing that, that I would that I would add to that, um, and you're right, and we kind of touched on it before we went live, is the um, difficulties with plastic specifically, uh, where the circular economy works. Um, it works very well with metals and glass, um, timbers and paper, um, because they're infinitely recyclable essentially. Uh, but with plastic, with so many different variations of plastic, uh, PET1, PET2 and so forth and so on, and all the different chemical comp um, constitutions that, that it, uh, they have, um, it becomes really, really difficult and a huge challenge to try and make that, um, to create a, a truly circular or recyclable economy with plastics. And I don't believe we can 
that's a, I don't believe that's a long term solution for plastics. It's a short term fix. It's a sticky plaster for plastics, and there is a place for it. So I don't dismiss it, uh, but I certainly don't think it's a long term solution. Amanda, yeah, I mean, I I agree totally with Neil that um, plastics really um, aren't suitable for this kind of thing. And there's too because we don't value plastics because they're so cheap. Um, and also lightweight, you know, it's too easy for them to escape. So even if we do try and capture them for recycling, and even if there are, um, you know, perfect scenarios, which there aren't where all the plastic is the right type that can be mixed and, and be kept circular, it's the, the issue still is that it's such a low value um, item that too much of it escapes um, either deliberately through littering or unintentionally just through blowing away. And, and it's really not the right material for a circular economy, in my view. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. And I suppose I think most people saw the news this week with Amazon and the Amazon waste. Um, yeah. debacle uh, and, and look, looking at that and looking at the sector which we work in in change extremes which is in construction you know the, there's a massive problem not just with um, the, the use of plastics in construction but also the amount of waste which happens in construction and I think Neil you probably have a view on this but but my view is one of the problems is that is the responsibility and accountability for that material and that surplus material because the contractors aren't too concerned about that waste because the client's already paid for it. So, it, you know, it goes into the skip and it, and it gets uh, thrown away uh, when it's perfectly good brand new material, which could could be utilised. So I think as part of the circular economy, we, ha we have to actually look at the top of the, of the tree, which is the redistribution of the of the material and, and, and make sure it's used for its intended use in the first place. Uh, you know, Amazon's highlighted on the, on the news this week that, the amount of waste on their returns. Why? Because they haven't got a system to go back in the supply chain and materials are very, very difficult to move backwards. They need to move forward. And I suppose that's my probably interpretation of the circular economy is making sure that the materials can be used and then reused either in the same format or, it, or repurposed into a new, new format. Anyone would like to comment on that? Neil, your experience, 32 years in construction, you must have a... You must have seen plenty of horror stories. I think we all know, <clears throat> um, surprisingly, when we set off on this journey, we realised very quickly uh, when we looked into plastic, the construction industry is second only to the packaging industry with the amount of plastic that it produces and uses. So we generate in the UK alone 50,000 tonnes of plastic packaging waste in the construction industry, it's just in the UK alone. So that's, that's pretty big. Um, but you're right, um, the... There's a lot of emphasis at the moment being put on energy and buildings, energy efficiencies, which is quite right. Carbon neutrality, um, waste reduction, etc. cetera. Um, but we, we don't think that you can achieve all these goals without bringing plastic into the conversation. And we have to look at that aspect as well. So with the waste element, we need to look at ways, you're quite right, that we can divert surplus materials, let's call them, not necessarily just waste. We need to reduce waste because we need to reduce the amount of plastic that things are wrapped up in or the amount of plastic that, are, that, that is in the materials themselves. We actually need to, where well, we've got uh, surplus materials, offcuts, uh, spare pallets of bricks or whatever, we, we need to find ways that we can put those back into the system and for them to be used for the intended purpose that they were made for originally. Um, that's a challenge uh, because the construction industry is, in my view, broken, uh, quite frankly. Um, it's been broken a long time. It's, 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 the margins aren't there. The margins are very thin. The, it's a conflict business. Everybody wants to fight everybody. It's just, it's just too um, confrontational a business and it's very it's a very big challenge to try and change the way that people think but we have to do that so part of the thing that we're doing a change streams as you know is developing an education piece and a behavioral change piece which will be delivered through a series of workshops and other um, uh, pr products that we can develop over the over the next few years to help people in understanding how they how they how they can work differently, how they can work more efficiently, how they can reduce waste, and how they how they can reduce the amounts of plastic 
that they use on on the sites. Can I just jump in a sec? Sorry, um, Neil, I was just wondering, because I've heard how there's quite a shortage in um, lots of materials at the moment in construction. You know, is this not an opportunity? I, I don't know where it could come from, but maybe where normally, say, a building is being demolished or whatever, you, you know, I'm not a, an, an expert at all. I don't have this experience, but is there any um, sort of opportunity now we have shortages of materials for that to be the trigger that people decide to salvage more stuff and reuse and repurpose, or, or is that just not a realistic suggestion? No, I think I think you're quite right, Amanda. There, there, there are those opportunities do exist. Um, interestingly, I was talking to the chief executive of one of the largest housing company housing organisations in the UK. Um, only the other day, and he was explaining part of his challenge is retrofit. Not the new build is quite straightforward to address and fix and uh, look at, but the retrofit is more challenging because they haven't been built um, energy efficient, you know, in, in when they were originally set up. So the challenge there is to make it to create something that is. Um, we're able to upgrade without demolishing, ideally. And if we have to demolish it, that's the last resort, really, because if we can't upgrade it for the for in the right standards that we need, then I think that um, demolishing should be the last resort. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give... it's so I was just going to say it's cheaper sometimes to demolish, isn't it? Because if you're building from scratch, it's no VAT, and you know there's doesn't seem like the the right incentives are there. I think the incentives needs to change. I think the government have to step in at some point and start driving change by uh, through legislation and through taxation. You're quite right. Yeah, yeah I'll, give, I'll give you a little anecdote of of how um, reuse and repurposed materials do actually work sometimes. There was a, a company which was um, changing um, hot water systems uh, in, in social housing and taking out brass tanks, or sorry, copper tanks, out of the uh, out of the houses. Now, fully enough, all those copper tanks were recycled <laughs> down the scrapyard because the person who was taking it out made an absolute fortune because there was a value. What we've got to do is we've got to really understand the, the, the value of that material and, and put a price on it and, and make people responsible. You know, it's about responsibility. That, that, that's the and behaviour change. That's the only way it's going to work. Now, we do have a question from the audience. Is why do so few plastics enter the circular economy? And why is there so much confusion about which plastics can be recycled? Now, I think probably, Neil, you, you'd probably be able to answer that one in the first instance. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, right, let me just read the question again. Um, okay, so why do so few plastics enter the circular economy? And why is there much confusion? Well, there's much confusion. Plastic essentially is, as Antoinette explained before, it's it's made up of chemicals, gas and and, and uh, petrochemicals, and they've got additives, nasty additives that go into them to make them flexible, rigid, and a whole range of other stuff in between to do different things. And they've been useful over the years um, because they're cheap, they're quick, they're flexible, and it works. But the problem is that we, don't, we didn't realise what we were creating when we started to design plastics and that our, our ability to innovate as human beings is... is uh, is, is absolutely tremendous but and what we've done is we've kept innovating plastic more and more and more so we've created so many different variants of plastic and because of that the labeling is complex um virtually non-existent um so to explain again we have to if we if you get a plastic product at home like a milk bottle um it might say pt1 or pt2 on it First of all, who knows what that means? So you've got to go online, find out what PT1, PT2 is. Okay, now I understand that. Then I've got to go to my local recycling plants, find them online. Do they accept PT? Do they recycle this? Do they recycle that? If they do, fine, I can put it in a recycle bin. And I know that then that should be recycled. In reality, a lot of it isn't. We know that. And I'm sure Amanda will have something to say about that and maybe answer that. But... Where we, where, where we think it will be recycled, we put it in a bin. Who actually is going to do that? 
there's not a lot of people time we're all time poor these days um you got to look at what type of plastic it is look at the labeling then look at your local plant every bin in every county in, in this country alone is a different color so where do you where do you go? i know some people have got five bins we've got three so every different authority works in different ways, the way they process things. And if you haven't got uniform infrastructure and uniform labeling and uniform processing globally, it's never going to work. And that's my view. I'll, I'll let others chip in and comment on that. Antoinette, would you like to uh, add to that? Well, I actually, it's going back to this linear idea and the fact that the whole process and also what Claire was saying about a loop, this is fragmented at every single step of the way from the start of what is my material, where am I going to put it, then is it going to be picked up by my district as opposed to maybe the village down the road or the town over there, it's going to go to a processing centre who are using market uh, prices to decide whether they're going to incinerate landfill or reuse it, and that can be vary. So up until um, 2018, was it the National Sword in China, when we were exporting all our plastics to China, they had a value. So everyone thought, oh, great, you know, off we go. China said no, and suddenly all over the world, people were left with fields filled of plastic because it had no value anymore. And the problem is if you're basing something on a market price based thing, as opposed to a system that says, you will do this, you will take this there, this and really make it go around. That's why it, 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 I, I live in Switzerland, okay? And I have been, my village will accept some plastics and another one will not. It is totally confusing and this is the world over. The difference, the other thing is that each processing plant has a different system. It is confusing the whole way around. And the other part of the question is, why do so much, many plastics enter into the environment? Well, Amanda can tell you, and it's drummed into all of us, you know, that only 11% of all plastics ever produced have actually been recycled, of which only 2% to uh, an equivalent level. So it just shows you how bad and, and leaky this whole system is. And the big question that we have not talked about here is the human health factor in all of this. Because whilst we're talking about plastics, they have in them chemicals that are actually harming us. Um, and, you know, they're, they're linked to um, reproductive problems. There was a book that came out earlier this year, Dr. Shana Swan, called Countdown, which actually demonstrates that due to ph phthalates, which are a very common component in plastics, that male sperm counts in the, in the Western, um, hemist Western societies have decreased 50% um, in the last 40 years, and we're on track for the next 20 years to hit statistical zero. Well, that's a worrying, that's a worrying factor. And let's go back, this has been known by those companies, and it's too convenient because at the end of the day, the bottom line is it's good <coughs> for business. And if it's good for business, let's forget a lot of the other things. And that's why talks like this, this kind of activism, this consumer pushback, all your books are so important because people are waking up to this fact now, which is super, super important. A, because not it doesn't just affect my health, but it affects that of my children and of my grandchildren. These are legacy products. There's a product out there called PFAS, which if any of you have meet, um, seen the movie Dark Waters, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a product produced by one company, um, Dupont, which is now found in the blood of virtually every human on the planet. And so far, <laughs> they have been fined $16 million total. So we have to sit there and think, okay, there's a lot behind all of this, that this has been going on the way it has. This has been good for business, but not good for anything else. And we've got to change that paradigm. So that's, that's my bit. Uh, can, I just, can I just say, that's I fully agree with that. And I think, you know, we, we've done this for the right reasons. Let's not, let's, let's be honest. We, we, have, we have developed these plastics and these solutions and these uh, materials for what we thought was the right reasons, for the right purpose, because it made sense. It was flexible, it was cheap, it provided us with, um, started off with Tupperware, something to put your sandwiches in, 
you know, kept your sandwiches fresh through the day. I can remember my mum getting me a Tupperware box for school and, you know, when I was younger. And that was great. Um, but we didn't know what we didn't know then. You know, we didn't realise what we, we asked the question now, is plastic the new asbestos? Well, quite frankly, I think it is, but I think it's 10 times worse because, as you said, you know, we it's in our food chain, it's in it's in our blood, and it's in the very air we breathe. Uh, a study by the Newcastle University in Australia uh, concluded um, that was peer reviewed that we each of us generally uh, consume one credit card's worth of plastic every week. Um, and as you say, uh, Antoinette, it's sad that it's got to the point that. We can only talk about it now because it's affecting human health. How many years has this been affecting marine life mm. and animal life? You know, if we saw a child in the ocean with a ring around his neck and he couldn't breathe or she couldn't breathe, we'd be doing something about it pretty damn quick. But it seems to be OK to let marine life suffer. That's not OK. We've got to work with nature. We can't work against it. We are part of nature. That's the, I just don't understand that. And when you think also plastic is made to last, which is great actually, but guess what? We've only been producing it a hundred years. And I, I've, over the last 15 years, half of the plastic that's ever been produced has been produced in the last 15 years. Then when we work that up and look at the plastic production targets for 2050, which are about to triple, we're producing at the moment about 450 million tonnes of plastic per annum globally. That's going to triple by 2050. That's a scary thought. Then when you add in the, scenario, the, the, the statistic that it takes, roughly speaking, three kilograms of carbon to produce one kilogram of plastic, virgin plastic, how are you ever going to achieve your carbon neutrality goals? Yeah. It isn't going to happen. It, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. And we need to open our eyes and we need to wake up to this problem. And that's and why also, we're driving hard. I, well, I think the thing about the <clears throat> exponential growth as well, that's the bit that, you know, a lot of people maybe think, oh, well, it's just too difficult to um, do things differently without plastic. But, you know, as you've just pointed out, it's only in recent decades that, that, that we've used plastic for absolutely everything. And often humans don't like to go backwards, but when you've made a mistake, you kind of need to look at how you managed before and go back and, and, and you know, but also with new knowledge and innovation. And I'm sure, you know, Claire covers this a lot in her book, I would imagine, you know, with the circular economy and with new sort of ways of thinking, because I, I suppose when our population was so much smaller, we did have that mindset of, well, you can throw away because there's a lot of space left on earth and you don't see it. It's not washing up like on, on the beach with that literally every tide. Um, but now it is, and, you know, we, we need to, be more careful like we were in previous generations where we'd look after you know resources because they were expensive and people didn't have so much disposable income but the irony is all this disposable income is from selling stuff we don't need wrapped in plastic it's just it's ridiculous yeah. really i'd like i'd like claire to comment on this yes, before, definitely. before she does um i'd also like to say you know we know, everybody knows of this concept now around the globe called beach cleaners. We've all come across them. We've all heard of them. How long have they been around? You know, they haven't been around that long. Well, funnily a, enough, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a marine biologist. And yeah. I remember when I had sort of like one of my you know, light bulb moments is when I was a kid, I used to go beach combing and it was mermaids purses. So skate and ray cases and cuttlefish bones and seaweeds. Yeah. And that was the yes. stuff I was picking up and collecting. Yeah. And as I started just to do more, but not beach cleaning, because you didn't really need to back yeah. then, we just started to see more and more and more plastic. And when I got involved with Surface Against Sewage, that was one of the primary reasons is that we were seeing, and on Brighton Beach, we've got a very, very large seafront facing uh, economy. So cafes, bars, etc. cetera. Uh, huge amounts of visitors every single year, which is great because we're a tourist town. But then that does come with the implications of um, our actions on the seafront. And of course, over pretty much the well, my lifetime. So um, I've just turned 41. So in my lifetime, I've seen it go from 
being not pristine there was always rubbish but it's just grown exponentially over my lifetime to include a lot of packaging a lot of plastic but particularly packaging and single-use packaging and that is the thing that we found and when we run beach cleans with SAS, we do uh, brand audits so we actually pick out the stuff we don't just put it straight into the incineration we try and break out stuff that can be effectively re lo recycled locally which isn't a huge amount unfortunately but we do try and figure out what that plastic is and it's convenience packaging, it's sandwiches, it's crisp packets, it's stuff that's sat on the beach for 20 seconds all the way through to stuff that's coming in that is maybe 20 years old. So we see that huge, vast array of both legacy plastics coming out of the ocean and stuff that is still being left here now. Uh, and it's very frustrating. Um, what we did see, quickly going back to the idea about how it affects us and our health, we saw quite a lot of people asking us, um, after Blue Planet, so we all talk about the Blue Planet 2 effect, which is amazing. I mean, David Attenborough, he, he needs to last forever somehow. Um, and we have a load of people coming to our beach cleans and going, we saw that scene with the, the pilot whale mother with the baby who had died because of the toxins in her blood and her milk. Is that happening to us? And that was a question we had on our beach cleans of people going, hang on a minute, if it's affecting sort of cetaceans whales dolphins large mammals in the ocean we're not that dissimilar is that affecting us as humans as well and that was really really interesting because before then not a lot of people had thought about how plastic in their everyday lives had maybe affected them internally not just their recycling bins not just you know their wallets but actually how it was affecting their health and i think that was a great turning point for people to start think maybe more selfishly but thinking more in the future it's not just about our environment <clears throat> about how we all work together in that biosphere sense us working alongside nature and how it's affecting all of us yeah neil knows my biggest bugbear around this which is chewing gum um mm. once you know once you've seen this you can't unsee it you know i, I walk through the streets of liverpool beautiful york stone york stone paving stones dotted with plastic and you can actually you can see society and society's activities you just by the shape of the plastic and how it's formed around bins outside uh, tobacconists you know you know throw that in with the um, the people who actually use chewing gum generally people who smoke so then you've got uh, thrown away the um, the plastic stubs in the cigarettes you know, all contributing to the problem so that's just my own personal bugbear which <laughs> really, one, thing really... with, one thing with chewing gum which i think is interesting it's great that you, you picked that up a lot of people don't realise that's types of plastic. Yes, exactly. So that's one form of hidden plastic we have in our lives. We could always, we could pick up a soft drinks bottle and know that's plastic. But when people are chewing gum, if you were to ask people what it's made of, they would assume it's a natural kind of gum. Now you can get those, but the majority of the chewing gums you'll pick up in the supermarket, in, in the tobacconist, etc., will be plastic based. And you're putting that straight in your mouth, you're chewing it, you're getting all of that tiny, tiny transference of all of those tiny bits of plastic into your bloodstream effectively. And we know that plastic can cross the blood brain barrier as well, which is an ins such a scary thought, it's unbelievable. So yeah, so hidden plastics are something that, again, we need to try and educate people about how to not only recognise, but how they can also remove that as well. Before we come on to you know, some tips and tricks for uh, Plastic Free July, do, do we believe that technology can play a part in actually making people accountable for their waste? You know, the, the, we've, we've got uh, blockchain technology now, we've got all sorts of new innovations around technology. Linking, and a simple example of that is, for instance, if McDonald's um, printed your um, your number plate onto the bag, so when when you see those lovely people who throw them out of the window when they finished, you know, being able to link that back to the person and make people responsible, because I, I I don't think we're going to solve this problem unless we actually get people to become accountable for their own actions and actually punish them in the pocket. Mm. Amanda. I'm well, sure you've got some great ideas for how we can change the world in July. <laughs> well, I was just reflecting on your last comment there, feeling like it is obviously littering is horrible. But um, I would say, you know, from what Claire does with the brand audits, you know, it's more the brands that are the culprits. You know, if you're looking for sort of people to, to be accountable and, and have responsibility, you know, if they're going to decide to use a really cheap 
horrible material to wrap and package their um, products and they profit from selling their products in that way with that the cheapest material they can get hold of they should be responsible and um, you know and and really it feels like the market isn't working to get people to make the right choices you know it, or it's going too slow because you know people we often feel like we're having a win you know where sort of people power and the fact that you know something like 80 percent of people would rather supermarkets use less plastic but it's the change is happening so slow and you feel like you know hooray i can buy pasta now with just like a tiny it didn't it used to have a plastic window now it doesn't have a window you know but it's just like you know that's one small change but everything else is like that picture behind antoinette and it, it's just happening too slowly um yeah we could do with like uh, international law just saying this is a mess sort it out um yeah. but did you want me to quickly say what individuals can do um because sort of my approach really is um it's the first thing is really you have to open your eyes up to the problem and i think that's um you know where for years and years none of us really noticed it creeping into our lives because it, it must have happened gradually and then suddenly we noticed that we come back from a you know a food shop and that everything is wrapped in plastic and that's not really necessary so I think the first step is really to become aware it's like with any habit that you want to change um, you first have to admit it's a problem and, and become aware of it and then the next thing is really to reset your priorities so you know why do we use plastic well often it's um, you know or something that we buy covered in plastic might be cheaper or it might be quicker, more convenient. Um, but then, you know, with the information that Antoinette's been sharing and also, you know, seeing what we see in the environment um, and on Blue Planet 2 and just ourselves by opening our eyes, you know, to actually shift our priorities and think, well, what's more important to me, quick and cheap now or like healthy body, not like exposing myself to any more of this poison, not like being part of allowing it to enter into the environment. Um, so, you know, it's just resetting priorities and then um, just trying to change some of the habits and it's it's trying, you know, to do what you can without feeling too much guilt for the bits that still slip through because the truth is we are in a system where um, there is still so much plastic. So, you know, if you can sort of have it that there's certain things that you could change, like never buy coffee in a reuse in a disposable cup again, like that's not an essential thing. You could live without that. You can either take your own coffee and flasks or drink in um in a restaurant you know there's certain things that you could and water bottles you know you could just always take a reusable water bottle so there's certain things that almost on any occasion you could just never use that piece of disposable plastic again but then there's others where maybe you need to be a bit more kind to yourself and just realize okay I can't be 100% but if I can be 80% you know there and that is going to make a difference in fact if lots of people felt like it wasn't that hard and that it was achievable if you go for the 80% of removing um, single use plastic rather than being perfect that would be better than just a few people doing it perfectly so those are like a few tips. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with all of that Amanda <clears throat> I was just going to say and you've, you've perfectly framed it there but you know, people have got to understand good enough is OK. Mm. You know, we don't try and get perfection because you probably won't achieve it. You know, even we won't achieve it. But good enough is OK because it means you're doing something. And every individual we spoke about this before, um, it can be overwhelming. We all get overwhelmed by the challenge mm. facing us. But everybody has a voice everybody has the power to do something and if we all do a little bit but maybe not do it great we do we're doing something and those simple changes yes the water bottles are quick things that people understand now and i won't buy a, a bottle of coke and uh, follow christian ronaldo's um, <laughs> you know um, idea which is brilliant um, let, let's let's buy glass bottles or let's take ideally a refillable uh, bottle but we all have a voice and it's for me as well it's um, this this doesn't just apply to the construction sector this applies to any industry um, when you when you're buying something it, 
why don't we just ask, have you got any plastic free alternatives in for this product? Have you got any products that, like this that are not wrapped in plastic? And the more people that ask that, the more the shop has to respond because industry and governments play to the tune of the consumer. And if the consumer is driving that change and asking for that change, they will respond. Otherwise, they're going to lose out. So by hitting them in the pocket or threatening to hit them in the pocket, they will change. You yeah. know, and I, and, I, and I think that's a big thing. No, I think I think you're absolutely right, Neil. And I think that business actually can play a part in this. <clears throat> you know, one of the things we do with our workshops is we encourage the um, the companies to actually speak to their supply chains and ask their supply chains to innovate plastic out of their supplies into the organisation. You know, you've got to push it down because they're the ones who are going to make that change, and ultimately it gets to the packaging companies. And ultimately, that it'll it'll then make them think and make them change. Then they'll become more uh, competitive because the problem is generally an alternative to plastic s sometimes is more expensive. But actually, if you if you if you drive the industry and drive the innovation, then the market takes over and it becomes more competitive. Uh, my my personal view is we should be taxing the plastic a lot more. But that's you know again for that behaviour change. Now I've got a really interesting question uh, from Mr. Mick Ord. Um, how easy is it to measure the plastic levels in our bloodstream? And if so, who could do this? Now, th it's a very good question because I think pe if people could understand that, that they've got, actually got plastic in their blood and it was measured, you would soon see a lot of drive and a lot of change. Mm. Antoinette? There's more to it than that because it's not just plastic. So plastics are two parts. You've got the plastic itself, the nanoplastic, uh, microplastic, or whatever that enters our stream. And as Claire said, we know it crosses the blood vein barrier. We know that it crosses lungs. And we also know that it's been found in fetuses. So we know plastics are in our body. So that's, but the element that we are trying to define right now, scientists are working on is, um, nanoplastic is like um, actually going back to asbestos. It was a tiny little um, uh, slice that um, sliver that found itself embedded in our lungs or in part of our bodies. Many cases it would, you know, the skin would scar over it and maybe you'd be okay, but maybe you wouldn't be because you're actually triggering a long-term inflammatory response, which could eventually lead to a cancer or, or other conditions. So, it, is it the element of the plastic itself or is it the chemicals and what is attached to it? Because what is clear, and this was held at the Plastic Health Summit that took place in October 2019 in the Netherlands, Lisa Bonin was checked for bisphenols in her blood and she had very high levels. And she's a, a TV presenter in the UK and she had volunteered this and she was quite shocked because you always read about bisphenols as an abstract, suddenly she was realizing what are the impacts that these have on me, on my endocrine disrupting. So when we talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals, let me just explain to you in a quick background, if because if, if, it's always very science, science The point is that we have chemicals, hormones in our body that are meant to switch on at certain times in our life. So they're basically from a baby through to puberty, Puberty is when a whole load kick in. Um, and then it's for women, it's for pregnancy and then for menopause. So those are the main points. But we've learned something over the last 15, 20 years, which is that when testing was done for these products like bisphenols, phthalates and so forth, um, the, the test was a big dose over a small time. That has a completely different effect on us when you're getting micro drips every day. And let me just explain mm -hmm. to you, if you go to a supermarket and you see a young woman who's at the cashier and she's handing out all those receipts, her fingers are being massively exposed to bisphenols. So it, but the good news is you can actually um, get away from them quite quickly. So uh, admittedly there are parts where they will have effects, but there are other parts where you can actually start to take effects, uh, steps to move away from them. So in terms of plastics, it's not just plastics, it's what are the other chemicals that we know we've got PFAS in our bloods. We know we've got bisphenol and we found phthalates. So those didn't come, let me also explain that those are manufactured chemicals created by man in a linear fashion. To this, to, to date, um, phthalates have been found in ants, 
mm. in the Amazon forest. And now let me explain to you what that means in a bigger picture in the environment. If these are chemicals that affect our reproductive system, what happens when we start screwing with the reproductive systems of insects? Mm. You know, these are much bigger things. So, and the other point going back to plastics in general is the problem is we have created bonded polymers that are almost impossible to destroy. Uh, uh, mechanical recycling just chops them up. And the reality of mechanical recycling is that you need to add virgin plastics to make them back to the same level. If you want to create a, a plastic bottle, plastic bottle, then you need to add virgin plastics. Chemical recycling has not been proven yet. It's, it's still a lovely a techno shiny solution, but we really don't have enough data to say that this is actually going to be worth it. So there are lots of, this is a complex, complex problem. There's just one thing I do want to say though, because we're running out of time and it's super important to me for Plastic Free do July. What I'd love is that people also think about their exposure to the chemicals and plastics. And there are four things I would suggest um, if you are dealing with plastics, make sure that you never um, heat anything plastic in a microwave oven because the heat releases more of these chemicals into your food and drink. And when I see mothers with, and I was a mother who did this, the baby bottle into the microwave to warm it up for your baby. I, I, sh I shudder now when I think of it. So one, the two is uh, storing food and drink over long periods of time. If you're gonna buy something and it's in a plastic uh, uh, bag, please transfer it into glass, into stainless steel or into ceramic or, or even a cotton bag if you can. Um, the third thing is that smaller packets have much a, a, a greater surface ratio. So if you are going to buy stuff in plastic because you don't have a choice, buy the biggest plastic that you can so that at least it's in, a, and if you can transfer that to something else, that would be great. We don't all have big you know, urns or barrels, but who knows, there may be a huge market now. And the final one, which was really interesting to me is warm, oily or uh, um, oily or acidic foods tend, mm. and they will show you chemical migration because if you've ever had a tomato sauce with oil in it and you've kept it in your Tupperware overnight, when you empty it out the next day, it's all red. Mm. So if it's gone in, what has come out? So those are the four things to really avoid for your health and your kids. Yeah, yeah fantastic. There's only one silver lining there as well, is that most wine comes in glass bottles. <laughs> Excellent. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> stay stay away from the wine boxes. <laughs> Claire, have you got anything to add from a, a product perspective? Because in, in product design, you I, I'm imagining you're at the forefront of designing out plastic. Yeah, I mean, uh, the students are, so I teach at the University of Sussex and the students get educated a lot about different materials and how to responsibly use the material. Now, what is interesting to say, sometimes the most responsible material to use for a particular application it might be plastic if you're talking about light weighting in particular but within the remit that it's not something that's going to come into contact with food for example as Antoinette has quite clearly said so I think what the students really we see them getting much more interested in is understanding that the, the impact of their actions with any product they're creating and even though they are fledgling designers they are basically undergraduates they are already starting to understand that if I create this thing how many units might it be if it went into production for example if they're working with a live client a live brief they understand the reach that might be global of that client and exactly how much um, one design decision can actually have a huge impact further on and we know that about 80 percent of any product's environmental impact is decided at the design stage so a designer a design team Whatever's happening with pen and paper, screens, concept designs, that is being decided. So we have a huge responsibility. It's just like when we say, you know, with Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. That's exactly what the design industry has, whether you're designing buildings, whether you're designing cars, whether you're designing products itself. And of course, what we, we think about, because the, the product designers that we teach, some of them do go down a more of a packaging route. 
And we know that a lot of the single use packaging we have is plastic based, about 50% end up being plastic or plastic derived. So a massive implication when it comes to actually thinking about how stuff is packaged. So yeah, we've had students work on refill concepts, which is great to see that expanding more and more and more in the UK. And actually a lot of supermarkets now getting on board with the refill revolution. So not just the high streets and the small independents, which has been the driving force of this, your small refill stores, um, small independents, even small chains now supermarkets we were saying earlier on how you know the supermarkets are very much paying attention to where people are spending their money and what smaller uh, innovators who are able to turn really quickly and innovate really quickly are doing so we are now seeing far far more uh, supermarkets starting to understand that people want to phase out single-use packaging um, from their their lives um, which is brilliant because then that will reach a far different market to maybe somebody who is able to shop all of the time at a refill store is able to shop at a farmer's market and maybe a more um, they maybe only only have a supermarket close to where they are having that more of an exposure will then reach a bigger market so what we will say to people with or i say to people with um plastic free july is first of all don't panic just like hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy don't panic about it do what you can and actually think about where that single use plastic is in your life so i've had people on beach cleans come up to me go what's what what reusable cup do i use what straw should i get what water bottle should i get and you go do you generally use a straw and most people go oh, no <laughs> well in that case you don't need a reusable straw. Quite simple as that. So don't think you have to go and buy this beautiful Instagram ready, fantastic, plastic free, zero waste lifestyle kit. No, think about what you actually use. Do you take away coffee? If you don't, you probably don't need a reusable cup. Drink it in with your friend. It's much nicer experience. But then really do that personal audit of your day, of your week, of your family or help your friends do it and then figure out where you can make the most effect. And if you see stuff, just like at the back of Antoinette, where you can only buy packets of peppers in multiple packs, and it's actually cheaper to buy in the multiple pack than it is individually, we're seeing that a lot. Call out the supermarkets on social media. Take the packaging back to the supermarket and say, you gave it to me, it's now your responsibility, what you're gonna do about it. As soon as it's in the face of somebody else, and particularly large brands, they will undoubtedly start to take notice and do something about it. But really, if you cannot afford to buy five peppers singly and you can only afford to buy them in a packet, then don't feel bad for doing that. This is packaging and this is single use plastic that's imposed on us. And we should not be responsible for it wholly. We do have responsibility, but we are not solely responsible. It very much goes back to brands and large businesses. Yeah, the, the supermarkets argue that the plastic actually maintains the life of the food and reduces that waste. What are the alternatives? Um, they, they are vast. They are vast, I'm sure. Amanda, maybe you can talk about this. Yeah, well, I mean, I just actually answered a question on the q and I mean, one alternative is that we have um, shorter supply chains and we buy food more locally. Um, you know, the reason they argue that is that, for example, they want to harvest a cucumber a month before the customer is going to eat it. And it's their sort of economies of scale that require that things are kept artificially looking perfect but actually the customer is the one that suffers because you know not only are we having this plastic forced on us we've also got um tasteless unnutritious food forced on us you know so so yeah i think that's really um not the best um solution really i mean so for those that can um access it it's obviously it's really great to go to a farmer's market or have um vegetable boxes delivered even trying to grow your own you know in the summer salads or you know some simple things herbs um tomatoes you know those are the things that often come really wrapped in plastic um i know it's not accessible to everyone whether sort of geographically or um, economically but you know th those are sort of the ideal situation and then as Claire says it's like pushing back and, and calling out the supermarkets because they're they're saying it's down to us and you know they're doing it for us and to prevent food waste and everything but it's totally not and we should at least um, make them be honest with the fact that <laughs> they're doing it for those reasons and, and they could actually shorten you know it's better to buy from a local grocer if you can but if you do have to 
but for whatever reason, for time and convenience, um, shop at a supermarket, you know, it is, you know, to ask them to have the, the things. Morrison's are actually quite good at not pa packaging everything in plastic. You know, if they can shorten their supply chains and make it more seasonal, then we will be reducing the amount of plastic there. Also, I would just add one other thing. The picture behind me, why I have it, is there's this whole um, uh, narrative that um, organic vegetables have to be separated from non-organic. So behind me is a picture of the organic vegetables wrapped in plastic, which is ridiculous. So you're paying extra for something that is um, infected with, you know, has is uh, through chemical migration. So those are the things to push back. And as you said, Claire, your voice, go back to the market, a supermarket and say, this is unacceptable. I just so, wanted um, to pick up on one, one really quick thing. We we're talking about packaging. We're seeing a lot of supermarkets switch from single use plastic bags in their produce section to encouraging people to use paper bags instead. Mm -hmm. Now, whilst this on the face of it is great because you can put your paper in your recycling bin, you can put it in your compost bin. When we look at the carbon footprint of producing a single use paper bag versus a single use um, uh, plastic bag over its life, paper bag has maybe three times the carbon footprint of the single use plastic bag if it is only used once. So this is, makes it really complicated because people go, well, it's great to use paper instead of plastic, isn't it? Yeah, use that paper bag more than once, but better reuse any bag more than once, whatever the material is. And again, we think about Plastic Free July. You know, I, I saw somebody putting um, onions in a sock in a supermarket. You don't have to go and buy these amazing organic cotton bags. Use whatever you can, but don't be duped when supermarkets tell you they're doing a really good thing by giving you a paper bag instead. It's not as good as it looks on the face of it. And also just to add to that, uh, this is the next play thing that we have not uh, touched on, is the substitutes to plastics. Mm -hmm. um, you're ending in the world of biodegradable, compostable, and many of them carry PFAS. And as one of the endocrinologists I spoke to said, you know, basically for the sake of a pizza that slides off, uh, glides off your, your paper thing, you're actually paying with your, your future of your children. So yeah, reuse, reuse, reuse. And in Thailand, when they did it, people came in with, um, what are those cone, mark, you know, road cones? I mean, they took anything, they took a suitcase, they took anything. And it was really, it became a viral meme of everyone coming in with the most unusual things to, to, to fill their vegetables with, which was great. Brilliant. Right, okay, so we've got a couple of minutes left. So I'm just gonna go around the panelists and give me, give me, it's a free for all. So basically you've got one minute to say whatever you want within reason, Neil. <laughs> I will start with Claire. Oh, do you start with me? Um, okay, so the first thing I'd like to say is um, do something. However small, however small you think it is, you can look at your life and you can make a small and incremental change. And you don't know who you're going to be affecting. If you put that onto social media, mm. if you talk to your friends about it, if your kids or their friends come around and see you doing something, whatever that is, to make your life more circular and produce single-use plastic, it will have effect on everybody else. So don't ever think that you're too small, but don't ever think that you have this huge responsibility to do everything as well. Uh, make a small change and see how you go from there. Fantastic. Antoinette. Um, my, my take, my go away is remember that plastics are a fossil fuel uh, derived um, element um, that affects climate change. So when you're doing something about plastics, you're doing something about climate change. Also remember that downstream, everything ends up in the ocean. And the interesting part is as everything ends up in the ocean, um, I work with Sylvia Earle, who is a, a doyenne of the oceans. Um, and she basically says, you know, every second breath you take comes from the ocean. Well, as plastics break up, they are releasing chemicals that are killing the phytoplankton that produce our oxygen. So think twice. I mean, we really need to understand the connectivity of how every single action we take affects us in the future and everyone else. Fantastic. Neil. Oh, wow. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, these are really good points. I'm finding it hard to compete with them. <laughs> um, I would say, as Antoinette just said, we rely on the ocean for our breath. 
And at the moment, we know a, a truckload of plastic is being dumped in the ocean every minute of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. So we have to stop that. We have to slow it down. Your vote, every time you buy something in plastic, buy a plastic product or buy something that's wrapped in plastic, you are actually voting for plastic. So use your vote against plastic. Buy non-plasticated products. Buy products that aren't wrapped in plastic. Buy seasonal products. Buy local products. Reuse, reuse, reuse. Fantastic. Amanda. Yeah, I think I'd like to um, come from a slightly different angle then and just kind of give hope to anyone that thinks maybe it's um, going to cost more to um, try and make changes that use less plastic. Because although some of the things that we've discussed maybe do cost more, um, if you're going to get sort of unwrapped fruit and veg and things, you will save money in other areas if... Um, for example, if you buy less stuff overall and you sort of try and just um, be slightly more minimalist and and sort of more content with things um, or, you know, for example, with products um, that we think we need makeup or or cleaning products or anything like that, you know, you can actually minimize and, and have in your bathroom, um, you know, really just go for like a soap that is a shampoo soap and a conditioner soap if that works for you or the ones I use are beauty cubes um they're really great uh little sort of foaming plastic free shampoo and you can get conditioner in a glass bottle you know you, but then that's all I need is hair care products I don't need lots of different plastic bottles which um you know the brands want us to do so I think what I've found is although I spend more on quality food that's kind of the right way to be healthy for me my family and my planet because I spend a lot less on all the other crap that everyone's trying to sell me that's wrapped in plastic and and so you know it's just to give you a little bit of insight there yeah. totally now thank you very much our takeaway from that is buy less buy quality and yes. no plastic brilliant well thank you very much that's that that hour's gone very very fast and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again very soon so thank you all and uh, thank you. we will see you on our next uh, in conversation with Changing Streams. <laughs>